Well, good morning, everyone. Good to have you all out with us this morning. And those of you who have joined us via Facebook and YouTube, if you'll take your hymn books, we're going to start off this morning by singing number 23, To God Be the Glory, number 23. If you'll stand as we sing. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. To every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Great things He hath taught us, great things He hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Sing it out now. Praise, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome out to Heritage Baptist Church this morning. It's so good to have you here on this beautiful Lord's Day, uh, second full day of spring. Amen. And I think God's given us two good days, a good start. Amen. Uh, I, the older I get, the more I hate snow. Amen. So I guess I'm old. So, but I sure enjoy spring. Enjoy that sunshine out there. We're glad to have you here with us today, and looking forward to Lord's blessings. Brother Tom, would you mind making your way forward this morning? And lead us in a word of prayer. But ask you to please keep uh, Eric and Jenna in your prayers. Uh, Jenna's getting ready to, to uh, uh, deliver a little baby Luna and uh, another grandchild for Brother Tom and Miss Suzanne. Don't look old enough to be grandparents. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to say any more because I got I got some of that coming my way here in June. But uh, uh, we're going to be praying for for Jenna and little baby Luna and, and uh, brother Tommy. Pray for, for pray for your family as well. Please pray for little Alex Fukus, please. Uh, just this next treatment he's going through, just extremely painful and just uh, really debilitating to the little guy. And he's really going through a hard way. So you've been faithful in praying for him and just gone through an awful set of trials so far. Pray, please pray for him. Uh, keep um, uh, the uh, Carsons in your prayers as well. And brother Tom, would you mind asking Lord's blessings? Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that we have another Lord's Day. We are able to come out and, and Lord, just to worship you and, and be able to spend uh, time together with, with God's people here as we uh, just uh, consider the singing and, Lord, the, uh, the time of prayer we have, Lord, for the, uh, for the music, for the, uh, the preaching that will come, Lord, the most important thing, Lord, the preaching. And we just uh, pray all those other things just... Uh, just tune our hearts, Lord, to be uh, to be tender to the preaching of the Word of God. Lord, I pray that you be with Pastor as he does preach to us today, that you give him the words we need to hear, Lord, hiding behind the cross, help him to be a help to, to your people here at this place and all those that are watching uh, through the through the Internet. 
Lord, as we consider our time here, Lord, and the fortunate uh, situation we have to be here together, Lord, we think of those who are not able to be with us. Uh, Lord, as pastors ask for uh, little Alex Bukish, Lord, for the family there, we pray that you would just uh, help him and, and Lord, just, just give healing and give comfort and, Lord, just help the family as they as they try to console and, Lord, just, just comfort them as, as uh, it's so hard to watch somebody uh, go through uh, what he's what he's going through, Lord. We pray for uh, Bill and Shireen, Lord. Just uh, thank you for them, and Lord, just pray that you'd help um, help in their situation, give healing to Bill, and Lord, just give Shireen strength that she cares for him. And Lord, we do pray, uh, Lord. Just uh, I do have a selfish prayer that you'd be with Jenna and Eric, that you would care for them, and and Lord, that you would um, just watch over uh, her and the baby as as uh, just in the in the wait time now and. And Lord, just thank you for, for things going well so far that way. But um, we pray that you would just have things happen in your own good time and everybody would, would, would be uh, doing well. Lord, we know there will be a lot of travel involved in, in, in between everything. And we just pray that you would uh, give safe travels that way as well. And Lord, as we, again, we, we gather today. I thank you for all that you've done for us. And Lord, just meet with us today, we ask. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated at this time. We have the privilege of hearing from our church choir. And I 
life is worth a living just because he lives. Thank you, choir, for that. Amen. This time, have another song for us, sir? All right. Number 300, excuse me, number 456. Count your blessings. Number 456. When upon life's billows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged, thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Are you ever burdened with the load of care? Does the cross seem heavy you are called to bear? Count your many blessings, every doubt will fly. And you will be singing as the days go by. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. When you look at others with their lands and gold, think that Christ has promised you his wealth untold. Count your many blessings money cannot buy. Your reward in heaven or your home on high. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. On the last. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God hath done. Thank you for all that good singing, and thank you, orchestra, for the... Uh... Uh, the, the prelude to our services today. I sure appreciated that. There's one prayer request I'd like you to keep in your hearts. Please pray for Janet Hohenschel. Uh, we, we mentioned her name last Sunday. Um, her son, Rick, uh, who lives in Florida, uh, he's a saved man. Uh, he's very near death right now. So if you please pray for him, uh, he's getting ready to go into glory. And I, I, I think what the old time preacher said is, is, is pretty accurate. Uh, as far as mourning for them, we ought to be excited for them. They're getting to go home in glory, getting to drop the stroke of flesh and, and to enter the presence of the Lord, but still at least behind a hole. And Miss Janet and her son Randy, just uh, just pray for them as well, because that's not an easy thing to, to have to say goodbye to a loved one. So you pre please pray for Janet and requesting prayers for her son Rick, uh, who's uh, getting ready to go home to glory. So we'll keep uh, the Hohen shells in our prayers. As far as other announcements go, uh, men, don't forget that tonight at 540, there's a men's prayer meeting in the room right across from the... Uh, uh, hall from the infant nursery there. Uh, also, uh, there's a, an announcement about our upcoming services for Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we're going to be having a 7 a.m. sunrise service. So Pastor Ross Wine, before COVID got on board, we used to have a, sun, a sunrise service at 7 o'clock and enjoyed that. And so we're getting that back on the schedule. Uh, we'll still have our 9 o'clock service um, for those uh, that are taking part in that. Uh, 10, 
10 o'clock, 10, 15 for Sunday school and 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock morning service. It'll be a pretty full morning on uh, Resurrection Sunday. Uh, so we moved our 6 p.m. service to the 7 a.m. sunrise service. So hope that'll be a blessing to you as you celebrate the resurrection of our Savior uh, because he lives. Amen. We can face tomorrow. And the choir just sang that so wonderfully for us today. I'm glad today that my Savior did die on the cross. Right. But I'm so glad that when he died, he didn't stay dead. Amen. Amen. He is arisen just like he said. And because he lives, I mean, we have victory over the grave. Death is is just a, just a, a, a slight closing of the eyes down here and opening them up in glory for the child of God. And so we thank God for his resurrection. We celebrate the resurrection every Sunday here. It is the Lord's Day. And we celebrate his resurrection from the dead. So we'll get a chance to celebrate that in earnest uh, coming up. So. Looking very forward to that. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that the services will be a blessing to you. Uh, where's Brother Dan at? I saw Brother Dan. There he is. Brother, uh, Brother Nate got a special award this week, a player of the week uh, for his work on the mound there, for his uh, for his ball team there. So I was pretty excited to hear about that. So just wanted to uh, just give a little shout out there to, to Brother Dan and, and certainly for Nate, uh, his good work on the mound there. So uh, the pro scouts will be come calling. Dan will be driving around in a Bentley out there. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But that's pretty exciting. When our young people do good things, I just wanted to bring that up. But that was exciting to see there. We're glad you're here today. Um, just uh, just excited to be here. I want to keep to my notes this morning, but I hope uh, that our time in the Word of God will be a blessed, a blessed one. We're going to be in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 6 this morning. So if you'd like to find your place there, 2 Samuel chapter number 6. And uh, today our final biography in First and 2 Samuel, we started out with Saul, Samuel. And uh, then last week was Saul. Today will be David. And I hope that our study in David's life out of 2 Samuel chapter 6 will be a blessing to you. And as we're getting ready to, to, to look at the Word of God together, we do have a special. So I'm going to invite those who are staying special to make their way forward. And I'm going to evacuate the pulpit platform. See if there's any room. The church has been silent while the world raised its voice, and in loud and angry tones they took the lead. But all across creation there's a rumbling in the hills as the chosen ones of God stand up to make His message known. I'm gonna shout it from the housetops Proclaim it from the mountaintops. Tell the world around me Jesus saves. I have made my choice. I'm going to make a joyful noise. The world will hear my voice. Jesus saves. The rocks and hills were ready to proclaim the Savior's might. But the Spirit of the Lord said they should wait. You see, God knew His children were ready to march on and proclaim His word throughout the land and seal the devil's fate. But the world still tells us daily that God is not alive and salvation's plan is just a fairy tale. But their lives don't change the truth. Jesus died for you and the word says His returning could happen any day. I'm gonna shout it from the housetops Proclaim it from the mountaintops. Tell the world around me Jesus saves. I have made my choice. I'm going to make a joyful noise. The world will hear my voice. Jesus saves. I'm going to shout it from the housetops. Proclaim it from the mountaintops. Tell the world around me Jesus saves. I have made my choice. I'm going to make a joyful noise. 
The world will hear my voice. The world will hear my voice. The world will hear my voice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Amen. If your family gets any bigger, brother, everyone will have to get a bigger platform. Someday it will. will. The building program will be on his shoulders at that point. So, amen. Thank you. It's a beautiful song. Amen. Jesus saves. Don't be ashamed to share that news with everybody you meet. Amen. He's coming soon. I believe that. We're so glad to have you here with us today. I do this. Anybody visiting for the very first time? Anybody all visiting for the very first time? Got a friend in the back row. I'm sorry I did not get to meet you coming in. Uh, what is your name, sir? Tony and Saunders, so nice to have you here with us today, and thank you. And I do apologize. I try to have good manners, and sometimes I don't. So, and Tony and Saunders, it's nice to have you with us here today in services. God bless you, and thank you for coming. Uh, we're in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 6, and we're trying to go book by book through the Bible and, and, and give some information on each of the books of the Bible, and we're going to suspend that for next week for Palm Sunday and for Resurrection Sunday, but then we'll get back on track uh, as we take a look at First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles after that. And again, I don't think we're not going to be able to fit it in in a year's time, so we're just going to finish up. I want to make sure we go through book by book through each book of the Bible and, and take at least one sermon out of the book so we can get a flavor for that and, and just get some understanding. I want to thank all the folks for the good comments on, on what we've been trying to do here. And I hope that our, our time and the study notes we usually have in the bulletin are a help to you as we uh, study the word of God together here. But today we're in second Samuel chapter six. Again, we're talking about David and, and probably one of the greatest things about David is what God called him a man after his own heart. And so that's going to be the focus of, of what we look at today, but we're in second Samuel chapter number six. Let's stand real quick. And I want to read the first five verses for you. Give you a chance to kind of stretch here real quick. And then we'll sit down and, and consider the word of God today. But in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse number 1, the Bible says, Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Baal of Judah uh, to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. We'll stop our reading right there. We're going to take a look at several other verses in this chapter. But I think here uh, we're given a really good snapshot of David and, and why he earned that testimony from the Lord, a man after his own heart. There are four things that I saw in here, so you can be able to judge my sermon. Uh, the points are not equal in length, so don't get excited. Uh, but uh, there are four things I see in here that I really believe contributed to David having a heart or getting that, earning that title, a testimony of a man after God's own heart. Let me just say this as well. As we study David, none of these things are out, outside of our reach either. The things that were in David's life can be in our lives as well. And when I'm reading the Bible, I really like to personalize things and say, well, David had this in his life, do I have this in my life? And David demonstrated this in his life. Am I demonstrating that in my life? And so when we talk about David being a man after God's own heart, there's nothing stopping you from being a man or a woman after God's own heart as well. These things are, again, God's not a respecter of persons. And what he saw in David's life, I want, I want him to see in my life too. And that's my desire today, making it very practical for us out at the outset. So as we're studying David, may we study ourselves as well and see if these things that are present in David's life would be present in our life as well. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, the beautiful weather on the outside, Lord, the, the good crowd here on the inside, and Lord, our friends uh, uh, that are watching from home on Facebook and, and YouTube, we just pray that, Lord, you suit a blessing to each and every need, as has been, prayed, has been prayed several times here this morning. Lord, if there's anybody, uh, Lord, in attendance, listening, watching, uh, that, that is doing so without, uh, Lord, uh, having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that today, uh, Lord, that uh, they'd realize their lost condition and realize that only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, can, can we be saved, our sins be forgiven, and we be given a gift called eternal life. 
Lord, eternal life is not tied up in religion. It's not tied up in our own works. But Lord, it is found only uh, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, please help me to make that message clear this morning. And Lord, if there's anybody without faith in Jesus Christ, may today be the day of salvation for them. And Lord, for those that name the name of Jesus Christ, who know the joy of sins forgiven and who've received that gift of eternal life, I pray that Lord, today through our study of David, we would just examine ourselves in light of your word. And Lord, that we would have that, that have the desire to have that same testimony uh, as well. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And you may be seated. There are several things that I've seen about David here uh, in, in this portion of Scripture. I believe they'll be of help to us as we take time to, to, to study that. We know that David, even last week as we studied Saul, was the man that God chose uh, to be the next king over Israel. Why? Because Saul had forfeited uh, his position by his disobedience to the word of God. He usurped the role of a priest at one point. He failed to, to, to take the command of God and, and obey it completely in another occasion. And God had enough with Saul and his disobedience and his failures to fulfill the will of God and the works of God. And God said, I'm removing you from being king and I'm going to replace you with somebody else. And we read about this last week in 1 Samuel 13, 14, where Samuel said to Saul, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because that thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Uh, again, a sister passage, this is found for us in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, and chapter number 13, and verse number 22, where we see again the testimony of David here. And when he, God, had removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king. To whom also he gave the testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. So again, we, we see the confirmation of that in the New Testament of what happened in the Old Testament, that God found in David a man after his own heart to be the next king. When we, come, when we come to the man David and his biography and all the stories written about David in the Bible, there's so much in his life we could fix our gaze upon this morning. We could focus on his victory over Goliath. And what an incredible victory it was. We could, we could talk about David not being so good. When we talk about his sin with Bathsheba and, and, and the murder of her husband Uriah, and certainly a low point in David's life. We could talk about his failure as a father with Absalom and the civil war that that, that, that brought about. And what a tragic uh, time that was for David. We could talk about David's mighty men and the men that, uh, that were gathered together to him in the cave of Dullam. And how he led those men into a, just a wonderful uh, fighting force that, that they're with him, beside him all his life. We could talk about David's many military victories. We could talk about David's uh, tender friendship with Jonathan, Saul's son. We could even talk about his escapes from Saul. There's so many different directions we could go. But today we've come to 2 Samuel chapter number 6, and we see another life, in, 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 another uh, uh, event in David's life that is worthy of our attention this morning. I really believe that showcases his heart for God and the fact that God called him a man after his own heart. What made David so special was not his exploits, but really it was his testimony. Again, at the heart of this incredible king, this phenomenal servant was truly his heart. And again, he was a man indeed after God's own heart. What are the things that you see here, Pastor, uh, in, in this passage of Scripture uh, that showcase uh, uh, the fact that David was a man after God's own heart? Well, for, first of all, I see this. I see David's desire for the presence of the Lord in his life. David's desire for the presence of the Lord in his life. Where do you see that, Pastor Ross? Well, in verses 1 and 2, again, David gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, for a specific purpose. He gathered them together and went with all the people that were with him uh, uh, from thence uh, to bring up thence the ark of God, uh, again, from the place where it sat uh, to, to, the, to the city of David. So, again, he desired the presence of the Lord. What, what does that mean to you, Pastor Ross? Well, first of all, I think that as we look at David's life, he wanted to be around God and want to be around God's things and God's people and, and the will of God. That was something important to him. That's something that ought to be important to us as well, wanting to be around the things of God. Now, we understand here uh, the, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, again, God would meet his people around the Ark of, God, uh, Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle, later on in the temple. We understand that 101 5 Lowry Avenue is not a special place uh, 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 because of, of the buildings, but it's a special place because of the gatherings of God's people. We understand uh, that this is not the house of God. This building is not the house of God. We understand that when a person comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, their body becomes the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So again, we talk about the house of God. You are the, if you're saved, you are the house of God. The Holy Spirit goes with you wherever you go. Amen. Uh, so again, David had a desire to be around uh, the presence of Almighty God. We get that present in, presence indwelling us every day. Christian, can I say this? When you pray, you are, you are taken right to the throne of heaven. 
You are ushered into the presence of God at that very instant you decide to pray. What an incredible privilege we have as children of God to be in the presence of God. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. I mean, we, we, we see the, the promise of his presence when we gather together in his name. So when we pray, when we gather together as a church family, uh, we have the presence, the promised presence of Almighty God. We ought to desire these things, cultivate these things, and, 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 and just cherish the presence of Almighty God. This is uh, the first thing I see about David. He desired the presence of the Lord. Uh, l- listen to the words of the psalmist in Psalm 26, 8. He said, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. I loved it. I love being there. I love thinking about that place. The Jews had a special affection for the tabernacle and later on the temple. That's where their hearts were turned. That's where their prayers were directed. Why? Because that's where the, the Lord met with them. And it held a special place in their hearts. And let me just say, saint of God, child of God here today, there ought to be a desire for each of us to have special places uh, to meet with God and, and, and to be in his presence. Whether that's the prayer closet, whether that's the, the, the public uh, worship service of Almighty God as we gather together as a church family. Uh, and it, we, we had a desire to be in his presence, just like the psalmist did, just like David did. The psalmist said in Psalm 27, 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. He said, that's one thing I desire. My great desire is to be around God all the days of my life. And guess what? We get to do that. We get to be with God everywhere we go, because he's with us everywhere we go. I like what the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, one of the most comforting promises in the Bible. He has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So wherever you go, he goes with you. His presence, amen always with us. And that's what David desired, to be around the Lord. How about in Psalm 84, verse 1, where the psalmist said this, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! How loved are they! My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. There was a desire, a yearning, a a hunger, a a thirsting for the presence of God, wanting to be where God was at. Child of God, do you have that that, that hunger today? Is there that thirst? I just want to be around the things of God. Well, I'll tell you what, as this world gets more and more messed up, and it gets more and more dark and more and more perverted, I'll tell you what, I find myself running uh, to the Lord. I find myself wanting to run into his presence and say, Lord, shelter me from all this nonsense and all this stupidity and all this foolishness and all this wickedness that's out in this world. There's one place I know I can go where there's calm in the midst of the storm, and that's the presence of the Lord. And God's offered his presence to us all through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? So David, what, what we see in David? Why was David a man after God's own heart? Because he desired the presence of the Lord. I can read for you Psalm 84 verse 10, where the psalmist says this, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. There's just an understanding that to be around God was better than anything else in this world. In Psalm 122, I was glad when they said unto me, let's go to the amusement park. Let's go to the ball game. If you're a pirate fan, there's no joy there. Amen. Sorry, just keeping some of you awake right now. But he said, no, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hey, were you glad when you got up this morning? It's Sunday, man. Something different about Sunday. Devil doesn't fight me usually any other day of the week. I'll tell you, I cannot sleep on Saturday nights. I get the worst sleep of any night of the week is is Saturday night. Why? The devil uh, just doesn't want to let that happen. Why? Uh, There's a lot going on on Sunday, man. We're gathering around the things of God. The word of God is being preached. The saints of God get a chance to respond to the word of God, make changes, uh, receive comfort, receive strength. I mean, there's so much potential that goes on on a Sunday. Uh, It ought to be a joy in our heart. Today, hey, today is Sunday. It's like, it ought to be like Christmas day for the child of God. Amen. Every, every Sunday. Why? We're getting to meet with God's people around God's word. We get to hear the choir sing and the orchestra play and we get to fellowship with the saints of God. It's a great day. Amen. It's a good day. It's a great day. It's a wonderful day. Why? Because we get to be around the things of God today. And we have that privilege every day, but just something special about Sunday when the children of God get to meet together. So we see, first of all, we see David had a desire for the presence of the Lord. Second thing that I think really contributed to being a man after God's own heart in David was this. He delighted in praising the Lord. He is delighted in praising the Lord. Look at verse number five. As they got the ark moving forward to its eventual destination, the Bible says, And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries, on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. Uh, again, what do we see here? We see a delight in praising the Lord. As soon as that cart got moving forward, they began to play. They began to praise God. Let me just say, Saint, this morning, child of God here this morning, there are two things that will show you your true spiritual temperature. One is your prayer life. Thank you. If you have no desire to pray, that, that, tells, that, 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 that tells a telling tale. 
we, we are commanded in the Bible to pray without ceasing. Jesus said, pray and wa watch and pray. He, he, he gave us that command, watch and pray. Keep your eyes open and, and stay on your knees. Th those, those are things that are expected by, by, by Almighty God from us. We're supposed to pray. Why? Because if we, uh, we understand this, we're not saved by religion. We're saved by a relationship. A relationship requires communication. God has communicated with us very effectively, very thoroughly from Genesis to Revelation. He, 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 he communicates with us through the preaching and the teaching of his word as well. We good? So God's doing his part, amen? Making sure that we've got his message from his word and from his men that stand behind his pulpits and, and minister his word to us. We hear from God. We can't hear from God if we're just listening, right? We good? I, I, I love living in this day and age because of the technology. I think technology can be used for incredible wickedness and perversion. But technology can be used for incredible good. When I get into my car, I turn my phone on. I have a Bible app on there. I hit it, say read, and guess what? Instead of listening to nonsense and political mumbo jumbo on the radio or, 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 or any of the nonsense that might be on there. My Bible starts reading and I get the word of God and it just floods my soul. Amen. And again, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We good? Your prayer life is one area that will show you true spiritual temperature. Do you like praying? But I see, I, I see here in David's life something else that, that is a, another indicator of our spiritual, our, our spiritual uh, well-being and that's our praise life. What do you mean, Pastor Ross? Your, your, your desire to praise God, your desire to acknowledge God and the good things that he brings your way. A lot of folks are, I'm, I'm, I'm too embarrassed. I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just not, I'm not the praising type. We need to become the praising type. Well, as soon as that cart started going forward, David's break out the music, amen? Strike up the band, why? We're praising God on the way. Uh, Christian, we need to cultivate, yes, our prayer life. We need to cultivate our praise life as well. I've said this a number of times. Let me just say this again. If you're afraid to praise God in the congregation, then, then, then find a way to praise God in private. Amen. Until you can become more comfortable praising God in public. Amen. I would say God's given us a number of acres over next door and get, get out there and just praise God. Nobody will hear you except for the deer and the, and the few groundhogs over there that run across there. Amen. But praise God. And guess what? Nobody else might be able to hear you, but God's going to hear you. David was unashamed to praise God in public. Amen. And again, I think this is what made him a man for God's honor. He was not ashamed of his God. He was not ashamed to let people know he was on God's side. He was not ashamed to let people know that he loved God. He was not ashamed to let people know that he had a, a, a desire in his heart for God. And don't worry about what people say. You, you just pay them no mind. But you just worry about what God's hearing and what God's pleased with. Amen. He praised God. He had a desire, a delight in his heart to praise the Lord. What does the psalmist say about this in Psalm 33, 1? Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for, his, for praise is comely, it's fitting, it's beautiful for the upright. Praise the Lord with the harp, sing unto him with a psaltery and an instrument of ten strings, sing unto him a new song, play skillfully with a loud noise. Again, uh, praising the Lord was, 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 was part and parcel of the child of God's life. In Psalm 92, 1, the Bible says, It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord, to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings, and upon the psaltery, and upon the harp of the solemn sound. He delighted in praising God, and we're commanded all throughout Scripture to praise the Lord, especially in the book of Psalms. Can I ask you to hold your hand here in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and turn with me to Psalm 150, the last psalm, last of the psalms. Psalm 150, it's just six verses, but they're powerful verses. And the chief word in that whole psalm is the word praise. Amen. Psalm 150. The Bible says, praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firm of his power. I guess we're supposed to praise him wherever we might find ourselves. And we're supposed to praise him for where he's at. Amen. He's in his sanctuary. He's in the firm of his power. Uh, uh, verse number two, praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness. And there's no shortage of things to praise God for. We sang that song, count your blessings. Amen. If we sat down and counted our blessings out and numbered them, we'd have a lot of things to praise God for. Amen. I don't have anything to praise God for because you're not thinking. Because you're not appreciating. You're not really looking into how good God's been. Uh, did you just draw air into your lungs? You got to be praising God, amen, because he, he put that air in there. He's letting your body work to, 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 to perform that function, keep you alive. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. We heard some trumpet players today, amen. I enjoyed that. Enjoy the sound of a trumpet here. But praise him uh, with the trumpet, uh, uh, the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord, amen. These are not suggestions. These are commands, amen. And we're supposed to find ways to praise him. 
David did. When that ark started moving, David said, we're playing. We're praising God with, with, uh, with the instrument he's given us to play. And so, again, praise was fitting. Praise is beautiful. Praise is, is suitable uh, for, for the children of God. What made David a man after God's own heart? He had a desire for the presence of the Lord. He had a delight in praising the Lord. Thirdly, I see this. He, uh, again, uh, was, was willing to demonstrate his passion for the Lord. Look with me at verse number 12, back in 2 Samuel 6, now to our text. Back in 2 Samuel 6, verse number 12, and look with me there. The Bible says, after the, the mishap with the ark there, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. The Bible says, and it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom, and all that pertaineth unto him, because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom uh, into the city of David with gladness. What had happened there was when that ark started moving forward, they weren't carrying the ark the proper way. They put it on a cart. It was never meant to be taken on a cart. It was meant to be borne up by the priests of God. And the priests of God were to take two, uh, uh, two sticks, uh, two shafts, and put them on either side of the ark and bear the ark up between them. There was actually holes made there uh, in, in the ark to be carried that way. But David did not follow the prescription for carrying the ark that way. He put it on a new cart. And when that cart started moving and, and started jostling a little bit, Uzzah put his hand up there to steady the ark. And as soon as he touched it, God killed him. Nobody was to touch the ark. The priests were not even allowed to touch the ark. That's why they had to carry it on sticks and set it down on sticks. They were not allowed to put their hands on the ark because it was a holy place. God was showing that he's not a respecter of persons. You've got to follow God's instructions, got to follow God's directions. And they didn't follow that. And when that, when that happened, you say, Pastor Ross, well, you think God would have been happy that they kept the ark from falling off there? No, God's a holy and righteous God. And when he put his hand up there to steady it, guess what? God kept his, his holiness and his righteousness intact and said, that, that, that's not going to happen. So when that happened, David got afraid. So did everybody else, by the way. And they took the ark off the cart right away. And they, they found a, a, a suitable place for it in the house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom. And they put it in his house. And guess what happened when that ark was resting in the house of Obed-Edom? God was blessing him. Amen. And God smiled upon him and let blessings fall and blessings fall. The well, word finally got back to David. Hey, David. Obed Edom's getting large, amen. He's God's doing him good. Uh, I know that's not good English, but that's good Bible, amen. Uh, he, he's pouring out the blessings on him, and David said, I got to get the ark up here where it belongs, amen, to the place where God put it in my heart. And so when David heard the blessings falling out on the house of Obed Edom, he went down there and did things the right way this time. They put the staves in the side, the sticks in the side there, picked up the ark and began to carry that. And, and guess what? Uh, they, they, they began to make their way forward. And the Bible says they brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. Look at verse number 13. And it was so that when they bare the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. What do we see going on here. David was unafraid to demonstrate his passion for the Lord publicly. He was so excited. Yes, they praised God as that ark began to move forward, and they praised him with their songs, and they praised him with the instruments that they had before them, but now we see what happened. As that ark's going forward, fascinating thing to me, as the ark's going forward, they take six steps, and David says, stop. We got to praise God. Amen. We got to, we got to, he just had such a passion that the ark only had gone six steps forward that he said, stop everything. We got to kill some animals here. We got to sacrifice to God. We got to praise God right now. And his passion for the Lord was so evident that he wouldn't let the ark go any further forward until he just let God know how thankful and how happy and how blessed he was. Christian, when was the last time you just stopped life and said, you know, I can't go any further without praising God. I can't go any further without, without letting somebody know how God, how good God is. That's a passion there. He said, Pastor Ross, people look at me funny. They look at you funny all right, all, uh, anyway right now, amen? Might as well just get, get credit for it, amen, on God's half, right? Amen. Somebody once said, you know, a fanatic is just somebody that loves Jesus more than you. Uh, call me a fanatic. I want to love Jesus, amen? I don't want to come in second place when it comes to praising him, and I don't want to come, come in second place when it comes to passion for the Lord. David's passion for the Lord was on displaying his eagerness. He only took six steps and the sacrifices are offered. The gladness that is seen here at the end of verse number 12, uh, again, they brought it with gladness. There was no sour face there. There was no, there was no uh, uh, bitter spirit there. There was just gladness. Why? They were doing something for God. They're moving the ark in, in a direction. They're placing it in a, in a wonderful place. There's gladness there. How many of you were glad when you got up this morning? <laughs> Tommy, Tommy had to stand up back. I know you were, Tommy. I'm glad to see you, man. Tommy, I'll tell you what. He, uh, there's been times when Tommy's ridden his bike up to church when it's been raining out there. He just wanted to be around the things of God. Amen? I appreciate that. There ought to be some passion in our, in our walk with the Lord, too. Not just praising Him, but that, that, that passion that can't be hidden there. 
they, they sacrificed after six paces, there was gladness, which was visible. It was recognizable. It was contagious there. But, but again, what I, what I saw here that just really spoke to me about his passion here, the Bible says in verse number 14, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. Now that dance was not like a wall room, you know, a ballroom waltz, but just more of an excited, uh, you know, have you ever seen a child you know, when they open up a present, they get so excited, they just can't contain themselves, they jump up and down, their little fists get clenched together and they just jump up and down and they start squealing and just excited about that. This is a picture of David. He just is leaping and, and jumping up and down. Why? Because he's so happy. He's so impassioned about the things of God. Christian, we, we've lost so much of our joy. We've lost so much of our passion. We've lost so much of this. And, and we've let the world rob it away from us. There ought to be an excitement. There ought to be just a joy. I know what it's like to be a sports fan when the Penguins score a goal and they beat New Jersey. That's good, amen? You get excited about that, amen? Good good play. You get excited about that as a fan. You rejoice, you cheer, you shout. Those, those are good things. There's nothing wrong with that. But let me just say this. We ought to get that. We ought to get more excited, multitude more uh, times more excited and more passionate about what God's got done for us. We get a prayer answered. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. When something good happens to one of our loved ones, that's a great thing. We ought to be giving praise and honor and glory to God. There just ought to be such a passion that, that just we ought to be like ticking time bombs of, of passion for God that we just can't wait to explode and just tell somebody how good God is. This was David. He just left and he didn't care who saw him and his wife Michael saw him. And boy, she was a wet blanket, wasn't she? Amen. Oh, you've been dancing for the Lord. All the mates saw you. Blah, 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 blah. He said, I'm going to do what I do because I love God. Amen. And don't, don't be afraid when people get, get looked down on you and, well, you're just an emotional type. Yeah, everybody's an emotional type, but I'm glad I'm emotional for the Lord. And so that passion was just, it just couldn't wait to get out of David. He just exploded. He began to leap and dance. He, he danced with all of his might before the Lord. Christian, when was the last time you gave God not just your heart and your mind, but your might? Because that's what God said when he said, you, when you worship me, I want you to worship me. Yes, with all of your heart and, and your mind, but all of your strength, your might as well. The Bible says in, a, in, in Deuteronomy 6, 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That means there's got to be a passion there. God doesn't want just your mental acuity, and he does not want just a, uh, your, your, your praise, but he wants your might too. He wants your passion. I'm just going to preach to myself, amen? If anything else gets anything, fine. Amen? But God wants all of us. And he made you with emotion. And he made you with passion. And he said, I want it back. When you worship me, I want you bringing it. I don't want you coming in cold and dead. I want, I want some flame there. I want some fire there. I want some passion there. I want some joy there. I want some enthusiasm there. How much are we robbing God? We get excited about mundane things like sports and sales. And weather. And we don't get excited about God. We've robbed him. Malachi, in Malachi, the prophet said, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings. I think we go a step beyond even just robbing God in tithes and offerings. We rob God emotionally. We rob God, we rob God energetically. We, we give God the leftovers. God says, I don't like leftover sac Second class sac uh, sacrifices are not acceptable to me. I want your best. We stay up until 3, 4 in the morning on Saturday night and, and, and wonder why we're dragging in on Sundays and we can't appreciate the things of God. We're grouchy and, and we're short-tempered and we're, we're, we just don't get anything. Why? Because we've not put ourselves in a position where we can give God our very best. It's a sin. There ought to be some passion about the things of God. There ought to be some excitement about the things of God. I'll tell you, yesterday I was wound up like a cheap watch. Why? I got, I got, a, I got, a, I got a text from the, from the deans. I'm not trying to give them big heads or anything like that. I'm not trying to take away from what God did yesterday. They sent me a picture of little Elliot going across the street to his buddies and witnessing to him and leading him to Christ. A picture of little Elliot there on his knees with his buddies on their knees praying and receiving Christ. That's better than any penguins win. That's better than anything in this world. How would You couldn't give me a million dollars for that picture. Where's, where's the passion? Where's, where's the love for God? Where's the, where's the excitement? Of that? I'll tell you, heaven was pretty wound up yesterday. There's presence in the joy. Uh, there's presence in, 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 in the presence of the angels. There's joy in the presence of the angels yesterday when that was going on. I, nothing wrong with sports. But there ought to be a lot right, a lot more right about a relationship with God that, that encourages a young person to go out and want to tell their buddies about Jesus Christ. We need more of that, not less. I'm not taking away anything from any, any exploits on any field of, of, of sporting activity, but I'll tell you what, that's eternal right there. 
that ought to inspire some passion and just some just some extreme joy. David, when he saw that ark moving, he knew where that ark was going to end up. I'll tell you what, he just he danced before the Lord with all his might. There's nothing that he could not be restrained. He just had such a, a desire just to say, God, you're so good. I'd jump around, but I'd hurt my knees. So, <laughs> But there ought to be some jumping up and down by the children of God on occasion. Amen. That passion was what I, I believe in part what, what gave him that testimony that he was a man after God's own heart. He knew what to get excited about. And it gave God all of his strength. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 9, 10, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there's no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. And then in Colossians 3, 23, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Whatever you're doing, whatever God's giving you to do, you're doing it for him. Monday when you go to work, you're not doing it for boss man. You're doing it for your Savior, for your Heavenly Father. He gave you that job. He gave you the ability. He gave you the opportunity. You're doing it for him. Somebody, somebody might sign your paycheck, but it's God that gave you. the. He, he, he's the one that gave it to you. Do it for him. My boss is such a jerk. Well, take it up with your Heavenly Father. And it just might be there's some lessons you need to learn there. If you're a boss, don't be a jerk. <laughs> How's that? All right, good. Get myself. You don't know my boss. I've worked for some doozies. I've been a doozy too, so. <laughs> Mrs. Ross is back there going, yep. <laughs> Amen. Christian, I, I, I'll say this. We've got to get our passion back. I'm not saying we just got to be wild-eyed, emotionalists, uncontrolled and things like that. But I'll tell you what, there ought to be, there ought to be something else, a, a trigger inside of us, a switch that gets flipped. We just come unglued for God and just say, boy, God is so good. And again, if you're afraid to do that in public, work it out in private first. Go to your prayer closet and just thank you for that answer to prayer. Go, go over to the field next door. God gave us that. Maybe God just keeping that field unoccupied for us. It's ours and he hasn't told us what to do with it yet. Maybe it's because he wants God's saints to go over there and just get, get loose with God. Amen. And just praise him and thank him and just get all excited over there. Amen. We good? Amen. I got to finish this. I'm looking at David's life. What do I see? I see a desire for the presence of the Lord. I see the light in praising the Lord. I, I see a demonstration of his passion for the Lord. He wasn't ashamed of who saw him. He did it in front of everybody. I see, lastly, I see a diligence to please the Lord. I, I'm not going to take time to examine verses 6 to 10. I've already talked to you about that, what happened there. In those verses, we saw the stumbling. We saw the sinning by us of putting his hand on the ark. We see the shying away as David took the ark off the cart and put it in Obed Edom's house. So we just see all that going on there. But now we see a return. Now we see a diligence to please the Lord once again. Look at verse 17 of our text this morning, this chapter. The Bible says, And they brought the ark, they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of the offering, burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. What's going on here? David learned to take the instructions of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord seriously. And he offered up the sacrifices that accompanied the placing of the, of the ark there. The Bible says once they got the ark into place, he offered up sacrifices. He sought the Lord's pleasure by following the Lord's commands on how to handle the ark. He sought the Lord's pleasure by offering burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. See, in, in Saul's life, he never learned this lesson. He thought just offering sacrifices would take care of pleasing the Lord, but he, he, he learned a lesson the hard way because we learned last week in, in, in Saul's life that uh, when he didn't obey the Lord in the, in the matter of the Amalekites, that Samuel had to reprove him for the Lord. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 22, and Samuel said, hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. The priority here is obedience first, sacrifice second. It does not mean that God's only interested in obedience. It does mean he does have an interest in sacrifice, but they've got to be in the right order. You can't buy God off. You've got to obey God, and then God will accept the sacrifice. And I'm talking in tangible terms. I understand the difference between the Old Testament and New Testament. I understand all that. But I understand this. God was looking first for obedience, and, and De David demonstrated that. It wasn't supposed to be handled on the ark of the Lord that way. There was no call for me to put it on the ark. He went back and looked at the Bible and said, we got to pick it up by the, the sides on sticks and, and carry it that way. Nobody's to touch the ark. My mistake, my sin. Once he got that squared away and they brought the ark into his place and set it down, then was the time. After the obedience, then was the time for sacrifice. What's God want from you today? He wants you just to obey him. 
if you're a child of God here today, that's, that's, that's what the father wants. I've told my children, I've, I think I've shared this with you before. I told my kids they'd never get in trouble if they just did what I told them to do. Can I say our Heavenly Father feels the same way? If you just do what I tell you to do, it'll be fine. And then comes the sacrifice. And then God can ask us for more. And, and, and we can see ourselves as a living sacrifice. But the obedience is, is key there. Obedience superior to sacrifice, but sacrifice is acceptable and pleasing to the Lord once obedience found. Let me just give you three tangible things to think about when, it, when we talk about this issue of being diligent to please the Lord. First, first of all, if we're going to please the Lord, we've got, we got to be people of faith. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 6, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So, again, if we're not living in faith and living by faith and walking by faith, we're not going to be able to please the Lord. We've got to be diligent that way. Are you living by faith today? Not only our faith, but it's our actions that God's looking at. Jesus gave us this testimony of himself in John 8, 29. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Are we considering God before we act? Is what I'm about to do going to be pleasing to the Lord? Could God be glorified in what I'm about to do? Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. David was concerned with pleasing the Lord too, wasn't he? Amen. This is kind of what made him help make him a man after God's own heart. He sought to please the Lord just like the son did, just like Jesus Christ did. The Bible tells us in Psalm 33, verse 5, he loveth, God loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. What's that mean there? That God loves when I do right. It pleases God when I do right and when I exercise accurate judgment. When I choose right over wrong, when I choose not to sin and I choose righteousness over sin, God says he loves that. He, he's pleased with that. But can I say not only does it take faith to please God, does it take right actions to please God, but even right attitudes behind the right actions. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians about their giving, he said the Lord loves a cheerful giver. He loves that we give, but he loves that we give in the right way. Christian, can I say we cannot please the Lord if we have a wrong attitude in our heart, if we have a wrong spirit in our heart. This is why God says we're supposed to watch our heart and guard our heart because out of it are the issues of life. You know, that, that's where bitterness springs up, isn't it? And it defiles us. It keeps us from pleasing God. So we've got to guard the heart. Our attitudes can ruin our ability to please the Lord. Pastor Ross, David was called a man after God's own heart, an incredible title. If, if I look through the Bible and I, I saw the three greatest testimonies in the Bible, I would say number. I, I'd say among those three great testimonies in the Bible would be Enoch. Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God, and God translated him, called him up in heaven without him ever dying. He's found in the book of Genesis, great testimony. Second one's also found in the book of Genesis. His name's Abraham. Abraham's testimony is this. He was a friend of God. Incredible. Would you like to be called a friend of God, known as a friend of God? That's an incredible testimony. And then we come to David, a man after God's own heart. Can I say that we can be all three of those things? We can have all three of those testimonies? We can please God. We can be a friend of God by just following God and doing God's good pleasure in our lives. We can also be a, a man, a woman, after God's own heart. If we follow the example that, that David set for us here today. What were those three, four things again? The four characteristics of David being a man after God's own heart? A desire for the presence of the Lord? Do you want to be around the things of God? Do you enjoy reading your Bible? Do you enjoy considering your Bible, talking about it, hearing it preached and taught. Second, do you delight in praising the Lord? How's your praise life today? Then ask how your prayer life is going. How's your praise life going? When was the last time God's heard you say thank you or praise the Lord or amen or hallelujah? God's done great things for me. Third, are you ashamed to demonstrate your passion for the Lord? Dave was unashamed at who knew he was on the Lord's side. He demonstrated that by dancing mightily before the Lord. And lastly, he had a diligence inside of him to please the Lord, to follow the Lord's commands, and to, do, to be whatever God wanted him to be after his obedience was achieved there. Four important points, four crucial points that I believe made David a man after God's own heart, and I believe can make us a people after God's own heart as well. Shall we pray today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to study this great man, your son, David. Thank you, Lord, for letting us take a little look into his life and to glean from these avenues that I believe led David to becoming a man after your own heart. Would help us to reflect upon them, to, to research them, to study them, and hopefully to incorporate them into our lives as well. 
Lord, please, I just pray that, Lord, you'd settle your words in our heart, and, Lord, that these words would not only be settled in our hearts, but also find, Lord, just uh, an outlet in our actions, our attitudes, our obedience. Lord, please, as we think of David, Lord, please help us to think of ourselves in the same light and ask ourselves the questions as to what made David a man after your own heart, that it could make us a people after your heart as well. Father, my prayer is if there's anybody listening that might not have come to a place of faith in Jesus Christ where they've sought forgiveness and placed their trust and faith in Jesus Christ and his complete work on the cross. If there's anybody like that, whether it be at home, watching on, online, or even here today, and they're unsure about their eternal destiny, Lord, I pray that, Lord, today they would seek out someone, Lord, a man, if it's a man, one of our men would love to take the Bible and just show them how to be become a child of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A lady, one of our ladies, would love to do the same. Lord, if there's anybody without Jesus Christ, without faith in Jesus Christ, saving faith in Jesus Christ, then I pray that today would be that day when they would they come come quickly to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith. Lord, for the saints of God today, for the children of God today, that Lord, we would consider David and consider ourselves in his light and in the light of the scripture today. We might have a desire to be a a man or a woman after God's own heart. Holy Spirit, please show us our, our faults and our failures, our shortcomings, our stumblings. And Lord, help us to have a desire, a heavenly desire, to be all that you created us in Jesus Christ to be. I give you ourselves and just ask you to have your willing way during this time of invitation. I'm going to ask Miss Wendy if she wouldn't mind playing. I'm going to invite us to stand to our feet this morning. We've God spoken to your heart. About being a person after God's own heart. I can see a need in my life. How about you today? You come. Make an altar of your chair. Make, a, make your way to the front. And there's a place to pray here for you. You come. God speak into your heart. If you're here today without the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know him as your Savior. All is in vain without Jesus. You come today. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and set me free.